Luke tonight, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to start reading in verse 51, and um, tonight's message, I'm hoping I can uh, get everything across that I'm wanting to get across, uh, you can understand it, uh, something that I think I, if we're all honest, we probably all uh, have this attitude sometimes in our life we're about to look at. I know I do. Okay, I'm preaching at myself tonight as much as I'm preaching to anybody else. So if uh, man, this if you feel like you're getting nailed in this message tonight, I'm not just preaching to you. I preach it myself quite a bit, and so that's kind of what I want to do tonight. I want to preach it myself, and hopefully you all get something from this too. And and I, and I might be preaching at you too. But let's look at uh, Luke chapter nine, and we're going to start reading in verse fifty-one. Look what it says. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though it would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. Okay, now, how many will be honest and say, I have felt like the disciples before and wished I had the power to call down fire from heaven? All right, I'm going to raise my hand. I felt that way before. I'm going to tell you right now, I mean, if I had the ability to call fire down from heaven, uh, there, there'd be a lot of torched places in the world. And if I had the ability to call fire down from heaven, can, can anybody guess where I would be this week? Philadelphia, right? <laughs> the Democratic National Convention. Man, I'd be there for sure. And boy, I mean, there'd be, I mean, it'd be a sight to behold, wouldn't it? But here's the thing. Obviously, um, God has not given me that power because I, you know, if God wanted them, you know, Philadelphia torched this week, or, you know, not the whole city. You know, we don't want the innocents. But everybody at the convention, you know, nobody's innocent there. All right? You think he can't do that? Okay? And a lot of times we can get real self-righteous and start praying for these things and wishing we had this ability. And we think we're fighting for God. We think we've got a, you know, we have a Christ-like attitude in that situation. But notice in the story, Jesus said, ye know not what spirit ye are of. And he didn't call out the spirit in the story. He didn't tell them what it was of. But I think it's safe to assume that the spirit that they had, it was the spirit of the devil. And that's what I want to talk tonight, about tonight is the spirit of devil of the devil in Christians. Okay, obviously we can't be, you know, I don't believe we can be demon possessed, but we can be influenced by the devil and we can have the spirit of the devil. We can be acting like the devil. That's what it means. You know, when you have an attitude that's like someone else, you know, you have their spirit. You have their attitude. That's why the Bible says not to make friendship with an angry man. You'll learn his ways. You'll pick up on his spirit. You'll act that way. And if we're not careful, even though we're saved, we can start thinking like the devil. We can start talking and acting like the devil. And so, and I believe in this story, Jesus' disciples were right to be upset with the Samaritans. I mean, here they go trying to tell them the good news of the gospel and they won't do it. They see that his face is though it would go to Jerusalem. You might remember the same thing happened when Jesus uh, met the woman of Samaria. His face were as it would go to Jerusalem. And that was something they took notice of. And the Samaritans didn't like that. And so, I mean, you know, you and I would be okay with them being angry. But it's clear their anger, it was not a righteous anger. And Jesus, he didn't name the manner of spirit they were of, but I do. I believe it's clear that we can say it was the spirit of the devil based on a few verses. And just some, I want, you know, quickly I want to read some verses. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Right there, Satan, he is the accuser of the brethren. You know what Satan does? He accuses us to God of sin. He gets, he's up there in heaven and he's pointing out 
the sin that's in our life. And whenever we start praying for destruction, okay, you know, and, and maybe none of y'all did this, but if, you know, you're praying, you know, Lord, could you please send a tornado to Philadelphia this week and just, you know, hit the convention or, you know, whatever group you don't like. And you think you're being righteous when you're praying that way. Okay, understand that, you know, and then we start saying, you know, Lord, they're this, they're that. We start talking about all their sins. Isn't that what the devil does to us? Isn't that kind of his job? You know, I mean, he goes around and he accuses us to God. And you know what? The devil, he doesn't even have to make anything up. I mean, think about that. When the devil accuses, I mean, the devil's a liar. But if it comes to, you know, accusing us to God of sin, he doesn't need to lie, does he? And, but that's what the devil does. And it would make sense. He would try to get us to do that same thing. Uh, Revelation 9, 11. It says, and they had a king over them. Uh, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, which means, both of those terms mean destroyer. And notice what Jesus said in that passage there in Luke. He said, I haven't come to destroy men's lives. Okay? And then it says in um, Daniel chapter 8, verse 24, many believe, most people believe this is about the Antichrist. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So we see here that the, you know, the Antichrist, he's going to destroy Jesus didn't come to destroy. He didn't come to end men's lives. He came to save them. And what the disciples were wanting to do was destroy men's lives. They were wanting to kill them. Okay, And think about this. If the Samaritans had died right then, well, they're going to hell. And that's not why Jesus came to earth. To, he didn't come to destroy men's lives. But, you know, and think about this, too. Once again, showing the despair of the devil. The devil, he's an accuser. That's what we're doing when we're praying death and destruction on people we don't like. The devil, he's a destroyer, okay? And obviously, we don't go around destroying people because we don't have the ability. We don't want to go to jail. But if we could call fire down from heaven, we probably would, wouldn't we? I mean, how many of you think, you know, you don't have to raise your hand. But if you had that ability, would have torched some places. Well, yeah, I know I know, I would have. <laughs> I'll, I'm just going to confess it right now and tell you the truth. But then, notice this too, what the devil does. Look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4, in verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Okay? So right here we see that, you know, it's not our job to destroy people's lives. Okay, now while I showed you those passages about Jesus saying we didn't come to destroy men's lives, there are passages we know one of these days Jesus is going to return and he is going to destroy the works of the wicked. But he, that hasn't happened yet and he is the one that's going to do that, not us. Who are we to judge one another? And think about this, who is the devil to accuse us to God? I mean, as rotten as we all are, none of us are as wicked as the devil. But yet he's the one, you know, he's standing there before God and he is accusing us of sin. And here we are, we're sinners ourselves, And we're going around, you know, telling God he needs to torch all these people. You know, he needs to send an earthquake. He needs to uh, swallow up that stadium. You know, when Hillary is given her speech, you know, her acceptance speech, the ground should open up, swallow everyone there and close back up again. Right. That's what I think should happen. But you understand that that is the spirit of the devil right there, okay? I, I, I'm preaching it myself tonight, all right? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go pray right now and try to you know, get this right. But I mean, invitation to the whole service. But now listen, we, we see here that that is, that is not our job to do that. If I had the ability to open up the ground and do that, I would, I'd, I'd, be, I'd probably be there this week. There's lots of places I would have already been. You'd have seen this done many times 
Because, but the truth is, that is not the spirit of Christ. That is the spirit of the devil. That's what he would do if he had the ability. We see that when Satan does come down to earth, when he gets cast out of heaven at, you know, in the tribulation, that he is going to go to work destroying as many people as he can. And he's going to have great power during that time. He knows it's but for a short time. And he's going to do everything he can with it. He's going to destroy everyone he can. If I had the ability... You know, if God gave you the ability for one week, you're allowed to torch whoever you think needs it. You can call down heaven like Elijah. How many people would go? And the truth is, it'd probably be a lot. You know why? Because sometimes we're guilty of having the spirit of the devil in us, not the spirit of Christ. And listen, I know what you're thinking, Kate. Okay? You're all thinking the same thing I'm thinking right now. But wait a minute. You know, there's a lot of scriptures that, that shows that you know what the wicked deserve there's a lot of verses to show you know we're supposed to hate the works of the wicked you know are you going all soft like the trendy preachers you know and just all you know hate the sin love the sinner no i'm, I'm going to show you how we're supposed to look at this and how we're supposed how we're supposed to think but I, I this this spirit this attitude of wanting to call fire down it's not the spirit of christ john 10 10 jesus says the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay? Jesus, I, I didn't come to destroy it. I have come to give life. I've come to give life abundantly. So what should our mindset be when it comes to the wicked? Okay? Because, you know, how, when you're watching all the foolishness that's going to go on in Philadelphia this week, you know, how are you supposed to think? You know, when you hear, you know, just... You know, when you watch the news, okay, you know, these people in the news media, when they just get up and lie, you know, they, they should drop dead right there. I mean, in my mind, okay, you know, Lord, strike them dead right there. You know, when the White House shine that rainbow colors on the front of the place, a tornado should have come and taken it out right then. In my mind, okay, this is my thinking here. Okay, this is obviously not the way, but how... How does God want me to look at these things? How should I think? So do I need to just go all soft and not let it bother me? When I see the wickedness that goes on, does God just want me to look at them and just love them and want to hug them? And, you know, what, how am I supposed to feel about this? How am I supposed to think? And so go to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you some verses that will show you how we should think when you see the wicked. Because, you know... My boys this week, you know, in the last few weeks, they've gotten a taste for just how disgusting this world is. You know, they, you know, they've been pretty sheltered in their life. You know, and they're they're out there tasseling, you know, working amongst the world and just find out just how disgusting people are. I mean, just the filthy communication, the disgusting language. And, you know, and from kids too. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous the lack of morality. Uh, you know, people just they have no boundaries in their life. And I remember when I got my first job at McDonald's, I, I was absolutely horrified and disgusted with the people I were. I, I'm, not I'm not trying to be mean right now, but I literally, I, I don't believe this was the right attitude. I looked at these people that I worked with with just absolute disgust. I, I, I could not believe what I had to work around, the type of lives these people lived, and I, I really did. I, you know, I had a pretty bad attitude. And the Lord, you know, showed me some things as I worked there. You know, he showed me, he helped me realize what I had been given. You know, the privilege it was to have been taught the truth. As I got to know these people and realize what they came from, you know, it helped me. It actually humbled me a little bit. And I realized, you know, I'm really not much better than them. If they had what I had, you know, they probably wouldn't be that way either. If they had been taught like I was taught, if they grew up in the kind of family that I grew up in, you know, and so it really helped me not to be so critical. But look, Ephesians chapter 2, we realize that and think that whenever you look at the lost, we've got to understand that the unsaved, are they are already as good as dead. See, why would we go wishing fire down on people that are already as good as dead. You know, you would be you, you would think somebody was a sick person if they had an enemy and that enemy went and died and they just, you know, 
felt like they had to go to the funeral and beat up on the corpse. You know, how much hate do you have to have to want to go beat up on someone's corpse? You, they're already dead. You know, what more could you want? And as Christians, why would we be that way to a people that are already dead? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, he's talking to people now who are saved, but the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. In the time past, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. You all see that? They're already dead in their trespasses and sins. They say, well, I, I was never as bad as the world was. Okay, I, yeah, I never did a lot of the things to see the world does, but you know what? I was still dead in my trespasses and sin. You know, if you go and you got one person that's dead and they've been dead for a couple hours and another person that's been dead for several days, did you know they're both equally dead? But the one who's been dead several days is going to stink worse. Okay? And so people who've been lost and been dead in their trespasses and sins longer, yeah, they're going to smell worse. They're going to look worse. They're going to act worse, all those things. But understand that they're just as dead as any of us were before we got saved. And God was rich in mercy when he saved us. And so really, it, when we think about it, it's kind of a sick attitude to wish destruction on those who are already dead. And they're, why, why would we expect more from them? Why would we expect anything from the lost? It really doesn't make any sense. It would be like finding disappointment in a dead person who doesn't accomplish anything. It would be like us looking down on those who have been a part of our church who have died because they've contributed nothing to the church in the last, you know, since they've been dead. Well, they're gone. You know, what can a person do after they have passed on, after they have died? And people who are dead in their trespasses and sin, it makes no sense for us to be wishing bad things on them. They are already as good as dead. John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now you're, you know, your trendies, your liberals, they're going to act like, you know, we don't need to be condemning other people, you know, when, of their sin. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. No, look at verse 18. He that believeth not on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. People who are lost, they are already condemned. Y'all realize that? We don't, you know, as much as you know, we're going to have fun just hating on what goes on in Philadelphia this week, understand those people, they're already condemned. But we just get in a big hurry. You know, we want something to happen right now. Listen, they are already condemned. They are already as, as good as in hell. And understand that that's the wonderful thing about salvation. We, while people are still living, we can pull them out of that. Okay? But it's like we do. We just get this self-righteous attitude. We get the spirit of the devil in us where we're just, no, we're, we want to see it happen now. Just no patience, not understanding that that's exactly what God saved us out of. If we weren't saved, we might be there right now. We might be dressed up wearing all the goofy things that they wear at those conventions. We might be there, vote, you know, get involved in all the stupidity that goes on there. But thank God, he saved us. And so the question we need to ask ourselves, because sometimes we do, we get, you know, people, they don't even want to be a witness. It's like, you know, we want these people to just go ahead and die and go to hell. So the question you need to ask is, what law does the world need to obey for you to think they're worth saving? Because think about it, we do. It's like, okay, I'm preaching it myself right now. Have you ever thought, I can't wait to see them cast into hell on Judgment Day. I, I shouldn't confess that, but uh, I'm going to. I, I've thought that before. There's a song that uh, one of the college groups sang, talks about, you know, Jesus, what a mighty name. And in one of the verses, 
it talk, it's talking about Judgment Day, and it says presidents and royalty. Uh, I can't think of it now without singing the song, but it talks about them bowing before Christ. And every time I hear that song, I think about Obama bowing the knee before Christ. And man, it just gets me fired up. You know, it gets me excited just thinking about that day. And some of the people that a part of me is just like, being honest, looking forward to seeing that, that's, that's, not, a good, that's not the right attitude. That is the spirit of the devil. Because, you know, we, do, we love seeing people get saved. You know, certain people. You know, we love it to, when you see these, you know, nice, sweet, you know, people that are from false religions that have been taught a lie. That have tried to be good, but they learn that, you know what, you can't get to heaven on your own good works. We love seeing those people get saved. But boy, those people who are wicked, that have done evil to other people, now nah, let's forget them. Hey, guess what? They are just as dead as you were before you got saved. And so, you know, so do we only want to see people saved who weren't super bad? Is that what we want? Or would we like to, or would we like to see people like the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus? Would we like to see people like that get saved? It appears from the scriptures that's what Jesus was in the business of doing, seeing people like that saved. That was why he you know, hung out with the publicans and the sinners because he wanted to see those people get saved. He wanted to save the most vile sinners. And he didn't seem to pay as much attention to the good religious people. You know, He seemed to be harder on them. I'm afraid sometimes our spirit isn't as much like Christ as we think it is. It's a little more like the devil. Galatians 3.21, because I said, you know, what law do people need to do? Because it's like, you know, we do, we like to declare, all right, boom, they've crossed the line. Forget them. Just let them go to hell. But Galatians 3.21 says, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that belief. So if there was a law that one could obey to, so they could have eternal life, then righteousness would be by the law. But he's saying here, there is no law that someone can keep that will save them. So why would we make one up? Why would we, why would we have that attitude? It was clear nobody could be saved by keeping of the law. So... The scripture, it, it, it condemns everyone. It concludes all under sin. It puts everybody in the same category. You're lost. You're a sinner. And if you want to be saved, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do. We have this attitude. No, people that have done this or that or people who don't do this, let's forget them. And I don't know if that's, that. I don't, I don't think that's right. You see, and what we do sometimes, we'll take scriptures from the Old Testament that pronounce some pretty harsh things on people. And we do, we start wishing for it. And I'm going to show you where that's, that's still not right. See, the, remember, the fate for the religious who are lost is the same fate as the reprobate, which just happens to be the same fate for the devil. Think about that. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus is given a parable about judgment day. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay? Where's God going to cast the lost? Into hell. The same place he's going to cast the devil and his angels. Do you all realize that the reprobate's going to go to the same hell that the religious person is going to go to that never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ? That's a pretty bad fate. And you all realize that that fate was once our fate? We, we, at one time, that's where we were heading, but we were rescued. We were pulled from that thanks to somebody giving us the gospel. Jude one twenty two, And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Okay? You all see that, that, I mean, we literally, we got snatched from hell, you could say. And once again, we do, we get to looking at people sometimes 
and we're ready for them to go to hell right now. But understand, they, like we said before, they are as good as they are already. Why do we need to feel like we need to wish down more condemnation on them? They are already condemned. I mean, they are dead in their trespasses and sin. Why aren't we doing our job of trying to pull people from the fire? While they're living, that's our opportunity to pull people from the fire. But we do. We, we have the spirit of the devil when we doubt God's word. Okay? Now remember, God at the, at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, he told them, the day ye eat of thereof, ye shall surely die. Okay? Now, Adam and Eve didn't die that day, physically. But eventually they did die, didn't they? Eventually they went. Okay? And the truth is, God has promised that the lost they're going to die and they're going to go to hell, aren't they? The lost are going to go to hell. A reprobate, okay? They've they've crossed. You know, we believe they. You know, they've crossed the line. They are not going to get saved. They will go to hell. All right. So, I believe one of the reasons we're just so anxious to push them over, <laughs> I guess you could say, is we doubt God because God doesn't do things according to our timetable. We want to see it happen now. I want to see, you know, I want to see the the evil people in Washington that are ruining this country. I want to see him judge now. But God doesn't do things in our timetable. Jude 1 7 says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Alright? So let's take, you know, let's take all the, you know perverts that are out there you know well, let's take these groups the abuse of themselves with mankind the sodomites the people that are, i mean they are they're reprobate there's no turning back for them they, and it's like we are you know we're just saying you know lord can you please rain down fire and brimstone on them you know lord can you please help them hurry up and die of aids or whatever like that whatever attitude you have listen it says right here in jude just like god destroyed sodom and gomorrah He's going to destroy these people. He used them as an example. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah so all of us would, would know that God, just like He delivered on His promise of judgment then, is going to deliver on His promise of judgment again. And yet, But yet many times we do and we look and we see what's going on with those groups and it's we start doubting that God's going to do anything about it. God's going to do something about those people. God is going to deal with them. They are going to spend eternity in hell. So, if you ask me, when it comes to people like that, we ought to be mourning the fact. We ought to be mourning the fact that we didn't get to them in time. We ought to be mourning the fact that we have done such a terrible job being a light in this country and getting the gospel out. That we live in a, an environment in a country and even amongst churches that accept that kind of wickedness. We are letting that happen. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be the light of the world. We ought to be mourning the fact that we lost those people just like a person. When you go to the funeral of that person that you know was lost and that they ended up going to hell, it's sad. You look at that, it's sad. It's a tragedy. We didn't get to them. We lost them. And, you know, hopefully, we would all think... We would all think you were a terrible person if you went to a if somebody was at a funeral and somebody was celebrating the fact that they're in hell right now. This person, they were wicked, they were terrible, they were my neighbor, they made me miserable, they were a drunk, they cussed me out all the time, but thank God, they're in hell today. Well, what a terrible person. So, why would we be the same way about someone who's living that's that's where they're going to go? We know that. You know, we ought to be mourning the fact that we didn't get to them in time, just like we would mourn the fact that you didn't get to your neighbor or whoever in time. It's a tragedy. We missed an opportunity. But the thing is, we do. We want to see something happen right now. And that's a terrible attitude. You know, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Don't let the devil trick you. Whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. Those who are wicked, they are going to reap what they sow. 
there, there's no two ways about it. They are going to reap what they have sown. So why, why do we feel like we've got to help it along and see it happen? I've had people before, nobody here, but I've had people in the, before. There, there was one person in particular. You know, I didn't want to be one of these parents that was always like siding with their kids. Whenever their kid did something bad, you know, there's always these parents, oh, my kid wouldn't do that. And they're always sticking up for their kids and stuff. And I'm like, I, I, was, I wasn't going to be one of those parents. And I remember there was a lady who, you know, came and accused my kids, you know, said my kids did something, you know, and they did it. They were guilty. You know, and oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'll definitely take care of that. I'll deal with it. And it was like this person got pleasure in telling me about my kids being bad and hearing about the judgment I would pronounce on them right there. And so finally I realized, you know, this person just needs to start minding their own business. You know, their kids are really little. These aren't big deals. And so finally what I just did, what I did when they would come and tell me about something they did, I'd just be like, okay. And I would just, I would act like I wasn't going to do anything. But then later, you know, I would go talk to them, and if they did it, you know, I would deal with it, but I never let them know what I was going to do. You know why? Because it, it was none of their business. But it was like, it, it disappointed them, and they, because they didn't get to find out what was going to happen or see me deal with it, they lost all pleasure and just quit doing it. And, and got over it, and that, and that was a blessing. And the truth is, you know, it's like we do. We want to see what God's going to do. We want to see what bad's going to happen to those that we think are doing bad, that we think deserve bad. Listen, do you not believe God's word? Do you understand that doubting the word of God comes from the devil? The devil is the one that does that. And the Bible says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. People will reap what they sow. But why aren't they getting it now? It looks like they're being blessed right now. It looks like good things are happening right now. All right, just rebuke the devil. He's telling you that nothing's going to happen. Do you not trust God? Do you not believe that he's going to do what he said he's going to do? He's going to do it. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that, was, that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, 